So we just got a ton of new information around The Outer Worlds. This is going to be the up and coming game by Obsidian Entertainment published by Private Division. That being a new RPG by the creators of Fallout. So something we're all very, very excited for. Obsidian Entertainment bringing us the style of game that a lot of us have wanted ever since Fallout New Vegas came out. It was recently revealed that Game Informer actually got a bunch of exclusive coverage of this new game. So over the next month or so, they're going to be periodically releasing certain things, one of the main things being a 16-page article on it. You could actually get access to that article right now by being a special digital subscriber, but naturally that leaked almost immediately following that, and now you could find it online, and that's going to be the core content of this video. But even further, the Outer Worlds themselves have revealed a couple of things, such as the fact that the game's going to get a physical release and actually retail for $60. In this video, I'm mostly going to focus on some of the new information from this article, things we haven't heard before, although if it does require some context, I will give that. And before you jump into this, if you're not super familiar with The Outer Worlds, or if you only watch some of the trailers and you think it's going to be a Fallout New Vegas 2.0, I highly encourage you guys to watch this video. It gives a lot of context and it will really tame your expectations, which is important here. And one last thing before we start this, there's actually a vote going on to win a trailer that somebody I know desperately wants to. If you guys are feeling generous and you want to go on this webpage and vote for Blower from New York, that would be hugely helpful for me. It just requires you to vote and put in your email. So as I mentioned, right now we're focusing on this new article, but even further, we hopefully should be seeing some new gameplay from Game Informer over the next couple of weeks. It seems like this article is only just the start of the coverage they're actually going to have, which is pretty exciting. One of the first things we really hear about is the replayability of this game. It seems like in several ways, The Outer Worlds is actually going to be almost like the opposite of a Fallout game. There's not going to be just a sheer amount of raw content for you to do, or radiant quests, or at least it doesn't seem like it, but rather there's going to be a ton of detail and replayability with the core story you do have here and some of the locations you can explore. There's going to be many, many different choices and ways of playing, but even further, they actually mention different endings in this game. One of the cool things they actually gave an example of in this article that will be a result of your different choices is actually load screens. They're going to almost be like little news articles and be based off something you did in the world and then some of the news outlets picking it up and reporting on that story. The core story of the Outer Worlds is basically there was a colony ship that flew off over to this planet in order to colonize it. Effectively, the planet was bought by 10 different corporations, which is going to be one of the major themes of this business and corporate America, but obviously this isn't America. The developers describe it as some of the robber barons you probably learned about in your history class from the 18th and 19th century century, except they didn't go away. They in fact started their own colony on a totally separate planet. When the game takes place, that all actually happened 70 years ago. And since then, the colony itself is actually starting to fall apart. And that's very obvious by even some of the gameplay we've seen in the past. Things don't look fresh and new. And one of the interesting components of this game is going to be that people actually living in these colonies are going to think they're living in a utopia. Well, in reality, it's more of a dystopia. And a lot of other characters you meet that are outside of some of these towns slash colonies will actually think the complete opposite, probably relate more to how you view it. Even further, there's going to be a local religion pushing this idea for people in the towns that is supported by the corporate board, saying that whatever place you find yourself in now is the place you're meant to find yourself in, like no class movement or diversification. Although interesting, something else they mentioned in this article is, in another section, there's actually a totally opposite group of people known as the philosophists that believe maintaining flow of the universe is one of the core things people should be doing, so two opposing viewpoints there. Well, either way, we find out when this colony was being started, as I mentioned 70 years ago when the events of the game does take place, there's meant to be a first colonist ship and then a second one that would come later. Something went wrong with this and the second colonist ship never actually arrived on time, so the corporate board just decided to leave it in space. It's not really clear as to why that happened or why they made that choice, but it seems like that might be part of the main story, at least starting off. And this is actually how we start in the game. Basically, there was a scientist on board that other colony ship. His name is Phineas. He didn't agree with the corporate decision to leave everyone in space like this and actually keep them all in their cryo sleep, so we decided to actually unfreeze one person, that being you, the main character, the protagonist. His ultimate goal was to actually unfreeze everybody, and he sends you down to the planet, known as Terra 2, in order to follow through with this, and it seems like that's going to be the larger mission in this game. One of the cool parts they actually describe in this article is the character creation is literally going to be Phineas choosing between which frozen casket he's going to open up. So as you're creating your character and actually choosing some of your first skills or attributes, he'll actually make comments on that. One example that they gave was if you choose a low intelligence character, he'll actually make a comment, how did this one pass the basic test to become a colonist? You also will get the ability to pick this thing called an aptitude 
attitude, and it basically was meant to be your vocation assigned by the corporation as if you really were a colonist going into this town. It seems like this is going to be one thing you pick at the start of the game, and it kind of follows through throughout the entire game, giving you certain bonuses to specific things. They mentioned there's 24 of these to choose from, but outside of that, it's meant to be very open-ended. The character creation and skill slash perk system isn't really meant to lock you down. You're supposed to actually have a lot of choices, and even in the early game, you don't have to pick specific skills, but rather you have entire categories. They actually go through the entire system and how it works, so I guess I should probably explain that now. If you're familiar with Fallout New Vegas or Fallout 3's special system, it's going to be fairly similar to that. So some of the different things you're going to be able to spec out in are attributes, skills, and then buckets, which actually contain all the various skills. You'll have perks, and then finally you will have flaws. So attributes are going to be one of the things you actually pick as you're creating your character. There are things like strength, perception, and charm. They're going to be a range of very high to below average, depending on how you actually spec these out. And these are going to have two major effects. As you're starting out the game, depending on how you actually spec into your attributes, it'll define what skill points you are automatically assigned. And then even further, if you actually take the extreme low of some of these, you will get special gameplay mechanics. Like if you take low intelligence, you'll have the dumb option when conversing with characters. Or even further, if you take the very low option on strength, you sometimes will actually do no damage when using a melee weapon. So attributes are without a doubt on the broadest, but then getting a bit more specific, we actually have bucket categories of skills. This is something fairly unique with this game, and effectively, a bucket category might be, let's say, ranged. There are going to be several ranged skills within that category. You'll have heavy weapons, pistols, and probably all the other things you commonly see in other video games. The point of these bucket categories is, for when you're starting out and you're not really sure how you want to build out this character, you can just put some points into the bucket category and it'll improve all of your ranged skills. But you can only do this until one of these skills in that category gets to 50 points. So let's say, for example, I actually Actually was doing the bucket category of ranged and my pistol skill gets all the way up to 50 and it gets there first compared to all the other ones in that category because of some other decisions I made or even some of the attributes I took. Well then even if I put more points into that category, my pistol skill will not go up any further. From that point, you also have the option of actually just putting skill points on individual skills. This is obviously way more specific. It's going to really branch you off in one direction for a given character. But the idea here is at the beginning, you could just put things into range, you don't have to really think about it. But then later on, you'll probably know what kind of character you want to build here. You also do have perks, which are not going to be really tied to skills. It's just going to be a random bonus you can get for your character, and you get these at every other level. One example they give is a faster sprinting perk, but these are going to be pretty powerful, especially considering you have a level cap, so there's only a certain amount of perks you can actually take. But then that brings us to flaws. This is something we've seen in gameplay in the past, and these are actually really unique in the Outer Worlds. So effectively, as you play the game, it'll just monitor what you're doing. And let's say you die to robots all the time. You'll actually get the opportunity then to trigger the option for you to take the robot phobia flaw. This serves two major roles. First and foremost, of course, it is a character building moment. It allows you to really define that character on that playthrough. But it also comes with an upside and a downside. The downside being, if you take the robot phobia flaw, enemy robots will now do more damage to you. But you also get to take one free perk as a result of that debuff. As of right now, we don't actually know what the level cap is. I don't believe that's been published. But let's say the level cap's only level 40 then you can only get 20 perks to begin with, and taking a flaw in order to get one additional perk could be very valuable. So valuable, in fact, that they actually restrict how many flaws you can take per difficulty level. So at normal difficulty, you could take three flaws, and at supernova difficulty, the hardest difficulty, you could take five flaws. And that kind of summarizes the stat system they have in this game. I don't really know what to call it. It is fairly complex, definitely more complex and interesting than any of the Fallout systems we have seen. But even beyond that, one of the other things we've heard about in the past but really got expanded on here is the leadership skill that you will be able to take. In the Outer Worlds, they're really trying to overhaul companions and make them play a much larger role than they have previously, such that you could actually spec your character into leadership and make it so your companions have more of a use. This is going to be one of the major pillars that you can spec into. So at any given time, you're actually going to be able to have two different companions in your party, and they're going to have various strengths and weaknesses. Every time you level up, you can level them up and pick various perks or attributes for them, but even further, they're actually going to play a very big role in your playstyle. They describe how some people chose companions to fill out certain parts of their character that maybe wasn't as well versed. So if you had bad charisma, you could then rely on your companion to get past some of those skill checks. 
Or alternatively, you could just amplify your own stats even further when a companion's with you. So let's say you're really good at melee and you take a companion also really good at melee, some of their stats will make it so your melee stat is only better. Even beyond that, each companion has their own unique combat ability. We've also seen this in the gameplay. And one really cool choice with this, when they actually do that special ability, or rather when you ask them to do that special ability, it'll actually cut the camera to showing them do it. And one common theme they actually describe with all these companions is they don't fit in. They're not going to be like some of the other people you find in the towns and they're all outsiders in different ways. They'll probably share your viewpoint as a actual gamer and somebody looking at a dystopian society than the people in the dystopian society thinking it's great. All of your companions will actually be stored on your ship when you're not using them or alternatively you could piss them off to the point where they leave you and return to the ship. The ship you have here which we've seen some gameplay of is going to be the main hub where your companions are stored, your own player home, and of course your method of transportation. After discovering a new location you can travel there. One of the cool things they actually go over here is they say as you progress through the game the ship will change dynamically. Like as you find certain collectibles you'll actually start seeing them pop up on the shelves in your room. The same thing goes for your companions. Each companion is going to have its own companion quest that will unlock something about them and after doing some of their quests or maybe uncovering a certain secret that'll pop up in your companion's bedroom on the ship. They mention how as you're walking around your ship and you have your companions there you'll just find them conversing. Different characters will interact with each other differently. Although speaking of your ship and travel there's going to be several different locations in this and even though in the past we've actually heard of two separate planets it seems like there's going to be a little bit more than that. They describe other things like a certain prison you can go to and actually a bunch of laboratories or science stations on an asteroid you can fly to. But even further there's going to be an ice planet and a gas planet you could see from the comfort of your ship. As of right now you can't go there but they also mention in this interview that they would look at expansions or even a sequel in the future so that could be the home of certain future content. One of the points they really drilled home with this interview was how much replayability and just different options there were. A couple of examples they actually give here is, you know that scientist Phineas I talked about towards the beginning of this video? Something they talked about in the past but actually expand on here, when you arrive on Terra 2, you eventually will actually be greeted by some people representing the corporate board. They say this will happen fairly early on in the game and you'll have the choice to actually sell out Phineas. They'll give you a ton of money, but then of course capture him and stop whatever he was trying to do. A point they reiterate is there's going to be a lot of moral gray areas. On one side you're getting a lot of money, but on the other side you are turning in your scientists. There's going to be genuinely hard decisions here, or at least that's how they're describing them. Or at the very least, decisions that are game altering to the point where it'll warrant totally new playthroughs just to see what happens if you take the other route. But also just within quests, if you want to go stealthy throughout the entire quest, that'll be a choice for you. But even beyond that, the Game Informer person that wrote this article says, as he was doing one of the quests to go get some medicine for the this guy, he saw how at multiple points throughout this quest, you would have a choice to go down a certain path or an alternative one, and how those decisions kept popping up and it would really change the outcome of the quest or sometimes even a larger outcome, something bigger in the game itself. And just a couple of other miscellaneous details that they did share I couldn't find somewhere else to put but are pretty cool. There's going to be robots in this game and it almost seems like there's like a culture where robots are really looked down upon. They're treated as almost subhuman and they talk about freely taking shots at them. But also a nice detail, robots are actually really easy to lie to. But also Groundbreaker. This is actually going to be a space station that I'm not sure we've seen gameplay of. And effectively Groundbreaker was that first colonist ship. Now it obviously it's a space station but it's going to be another location you can explore. But yeah that's it right now for the Outer Worlds. Again we just got a ton of information on this game. If you missed some of my past videos on this I highly recommend watching them. But otherwise I will have more as we learn more. I'm very excited for this. It's coming in 2019 so the wait isn't even that long. But with that I hope to see you guys all next time. Later.